Let's assume that the climate is not changing for the worse. Let's assume that all the effects that would come as a result of this change are also things that are not going to happen. An increase in the average temperature of the globe, we're going to assume that this is not going to happen. An increase in the number of extreme weather events, we're going to assume this is not going to happen. An increase in ocean acidification, rising sea levels, melting of the ice caps, we're going to assume all of this is not going to happen. If we assume that the environment is going to remain stable for, say, the next 100,000 years or so, are we cool? Fine? Uh, continue business as usual? Well, not really. It turns out the primary action that is needed to combat the effects of climate change is an action that we're going to have to take regardless whether the climate is changing for the worse or even changing for the better. Before we discuss why this is the case, it is important for us to understand the current understanding for why it is believed that the climate is changing for the worst. Climate change is a natural process and has happened many times in the past. In the context of humans, today it is being driven by unnatural processes, human actions. The primary reason for why it is believed that the climate is changing for the worst is the release of greenhouse gases through various human activities. Greenhouse gases include carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and other types of gases as well. Greenhouse gases makes it harder for the radiation that we receive from the sun to escape back into space. So overall, average temperatures end up being higher than usual. The primary source of human emitted greenhouse gases is the extraction, processing, and consumption of fossil fuels, oil, coal, and natural gas. If we consume enough fossil fuels, then we're going to emit enough greenhouse gases into the atmosphere to pass certain temperature breakpoints. The more greenhouse gases we emit into the atmosphere, the more pronounced are the effects that I have mentioned in the beginning part of this video. If we increase the average temperature of the globe at an enough rate, then we're going to start melting some of the permafrost that we have here on the planet. This is a problem. Why? Because permafrost locations on Earth are responsible for reflecting some of the sun's radiation back into space. So if we melt these permafrost locations, what would happen? We would get even more increases in the average temperature of the globe. But the process does not end there. That is because a lot of the permafrost that we have here on Earth is holding methane, a greenhouse gas, a prisoner and not releasing it into the atmosphere. So if we increase the average temperature of the globe at an enough rate, then this permafrost would start melting, some of this methane would be released into the atmosphere, and now you end up with even higher temperatures than usual. But it doesn't even end there. A higher average temperature than usual would make it so that we have more water vapor in the atmosphere than usual. And water vapor acts as a greenhouse gas as well. And what would that do? Even higher increases in temperature. And this just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Now, there are different scenarios for how bad this could get, and this depends very heavily on how much greenhouse gases we end up pumping into the atmosphere in the next few decades, which is primarily driven by how much fossil fuels we consume in the same period of time. The overall overwhelming scientific evidence points to the fact that the climate is in fact changing for the worse and it is primarily driven by human actions. But for the sake of exploring what our options are, we're going to assume that this is not the case. The main reason for why we're going to have to take similar actions, whether the climate is changing or it's not changing, whether it's man-made or it's not man-made, is because of how energy is tied to our economic system. To understand why this is the case, let's take a look at a system that has been in play here on Earth for hundreds of millions of years. It's being used by life. If you look at any kind of life form, it is usually doing something, moving, growing, trying to eat or avoid being eaten, trying to mate and make more of itself, and so on and so forth. How is any life form able to do any of this is because of energy. Where do life forms get their energy from? The sun. The sun produces energy through the collision of atoms. Two atoms fuse together, release some of the energy contained within the matter that makes these atoms, and then some of that energy spends a hundred thousand years 
getting out of the sun, reaching the earth, and then primary producers here on earth, these are life forms that are able to take the sun's energy and make it into life, take that energy, become life, and then other life forms prey on these primary producers and become the wide, diverse range of species that you see here on earth. There are other primary producers that are able to use other types of energy such as the heated chemicals created by hydrothermal vents at the bottom of earth's oceans but those are very rare when compared to life forms that are dependent on the sun's energy. Now it may seem that we as humans with our sophisticated economic system and our complete domination of the planet have in fact escaped this system that has been in play here for hundreds of millions of years. But we haven't, not even close. We are still dependent on energy that comes from the sun, just as any other life form on the planet. And we are not about to become independent from this energy anytime soon. The absolute majority of our energy consumption today comes from fossil fuels, oil, coal, and natural gas. What are fossil fuels? They are ancient life forms that have existed millions to hundreds of millions of years ago that lived their own life, died, decomposed, seeped into the earth, a lot of heat and pressure were applied to them, and they became the fossil fuels that we know and love. Where did these life forms get their energy from? The same way any regular life form gets its energy from, and that would be nuclear fusion processes that originated in the core of the sun. Essentially, generating energy through fossil fuels indirectly is still the same source that allows us to generate energy through things like solar panels, biofuels, and even drying your laundry outside. However, this still doesn't paint you the full picture for how reliant we are on the sun. Take generating energy through the capture of wind. How is wind generated? Yes, it's big boss the sun. The sun heats up Earth's atmosphere at different rates, causing some air to be lighter than other types of air, creating areas of high pressure and low pressure, making the high pressure areas move into lower pressure areas. This causes air to go into motion. We can capture this motion and turn it into useful energy. Hydropower follows a similar pattern, as the sun is the main driver responsible for driving the hydrological cycle. You might say, what about geothermal energy, capturing some of the heat that exists as part of Earth itself and turning that into useful energy? Or splitting atoms, the opposite of nuclear fusion processes that happen in the core of the sun. Nuclear fission, what about those? Those don't depend on the sun. And you would be right, they really don't depend on the sun that much. But they do, in fact, depend on nuclear fusion processes that happened in ancient stars that have existed in the past. The heat that exists in Earth's core comes from two main sources. Heat that was left over from the formation of our solar system, plus the decay of radioactive elements. These same radioactive elements is what allows us to generate energy through nuclear fission processes. Where did these radioactive elements come from? Well, they were made possible because of nuclear fusion processes that have happened in the cores of ancient stars while they were dying. The thing is, fossil fuels are not going to be here forever. There is a limited finite supply. We're not really going to run out of fossil fuels. What is likely to happen is that as we continue to increase our consumption of these fossil fuels, we're going to make them more and more expensive to use over time. Eventually, we're going to have to migrate to using other sources of energy. The thing is, there's an argument that could be made that we should continue business as usual, continue increasing our consumption of fossil fuels in the hopes that before these fossil fuels become too expensive to extract, process, and consume, we come up with a technology that allows us to generate energy better than any other form of energy generation. One such example is nuclear fusion technology. There's actually a huge collaboration project called the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, which is attempting to see whether it is feasible for us to artificially create a nuclear fusion process where the amount of energy we get out of this process is more than the amount of energy we put into this process. This is actually something that has never been achieved before. The thing is, the project is not scheduled to achieve first plasma until the year 2025, and it's probably going to take a decade after that before it becomes fully operational. The energy it is intended to generate is around 500 megawatts, and when you take into account how much money it's going to cost, 18 billion euros, you're quickly going to deduce that the ITER project is a proof of concept. 
Not only that, the energy generated by the project is not going to be used in any useful way like that of electricity. It's not a design feature just yet. Basically, we are nowhere close to mobilizing nuclear fusion technology on a global scale and on a commercial scale just yet. A fact that the ITER team themselves mention on their website. Now, there are different ways to measure the economic attractiveness of an energy source, each with their pros and cons. The one we are using in this video is energy returned on energy invested. The main reason we are using this kind of measure is that it's a physical measure independent of monetary spending. One of the downsides of this measure is that the calculation required to come up with a value of energy returned on energy invested for an energy source is very complex as you need to take into account all factors that are needed to take energy out of an energy source across its lifetime and this could have many layers to it. That's why different authors disagree on the value of energy return for energy invested for different energy sources. The general trend is, however, is that oil and natural gases return has declined over time. Coal's return has remained relatively stable and will likely remain stable for the next few decades or so. And that's because coal's supply comparatively is much higher than oil and natural gas. As for clean energy sources, these figures represent the current average energy return on energy invested as calculated by different publications. Depending on the location of the investment, these figures are likely to vary a bit. Now, if you compare these numbers, you're going to notice that clean energy sources return is in fact competitive with oil and natural gases return. And while coal's return seems to be relatively high, it is likely that clean energy sources will in fact catch up to it in the future. The thing is, it is possible to improve the energy return on energy invested for an energy source by spending time, money and effort on research and development so that hopefully you would come up with a technological development that would improve the efficiency of an energy source. The problem is, for finite limited energy sources, this quickly becomes a game of catch. An energy source becomes too expensive, spend time, money and effort to make it more efficient. It becomes expensive again, do the same process again. It becomes even more expensive, then do the same thing, and so on and so forth. The issue is, as I've discussed in my video here, technological development is not a linear process and appears to become more expensive the more complex the technology becomes. In summary, whether the climate is changing for the worse or even changing for the better, it is clear that the primary action that is needed to combat the effects of climate change is an action that we're going to have to implement eventually. We're going to have to migrate away from unsustainable limited energy sources, fossil fuels mostly, to other sustainable energy sources, wind, solar, hydropower, geothermal, and hopefully far in the future, nuclear fusion. The thing is, we could choose the option of delaying the migration away from unsustainable energy sources to sustainable energy sources in the hopes that we could continue to benefit from the high energy return on energy invested of limited, finite energy sources. But this option is still not a very good one, even when we do not take climate change effects into account. If we increase our investment in unsustainable energy sources too much, then we could potentially make them much more expensive to use when compared to transitioning to other sustainable forms of energy sooner. Yes, we could come up with a technological development that could extend the lifetime of unsustainable energy sources, but the fact is we're going to have to move away from them eventually to sustainable forms of energy. If we increase our investment in unsustainable forms of energy too much, then that means the infrastructure that supports the consumption of these unsustainable forms of energy would also become larger and that would mean we would end up tripping and hitting our face much harder than if we were to transition to sustainable forms of energy sooner. And remember, this is with assuming that the climate does not change for the worse as we increase our consumption of unsustainable energy sources, specifically oil, coal, and natural gas. But that's not what the scientific evidence says. The overwhelming scientific evidence says that if we increase our consumption of unsustainable energy sources, specifically oil, coal, and natural gas, then because of the increased amount of greenhouse gas emissions we end up pumping into the atmosphere, then the climate is likely to change for the worse. So if we increase our consumption of unsustainable energy sources, specifically oil, oil, coal, and natural gas, then the effects that I've mentioned in the beginning part of this video are very likely to happen, and they're likely to happen in a very bad way. This would virtually increase the cost of every economic activity, not just the consumption 
of unsustainable energy sources, specifically oil, coal, and natural gas. And there could be unpredictable effects that could be absolutely catastrophic to both humans and other life forms on the planet. The choice here is very clear. 